Patentomatics channel. Welcome to Patentomatics channel. In our today's topic we are going to talk about the sewing machine patent, U. S. Patent number 5758, issued to Elias Howe in 1846. On September 10, 1846, Elias Howe was granted a patent for his sewing machine. Howe claimed that his machine could sew 250 stitches a minute. Invention of the sewing machine revolutionized the textile and garment industries. Sewing machine patent model. Patent number 4750, issued September 10, 1846 Elias Howe Jr. of Cambridge, Massachusetts. While working as a journeyman machinist, Elias Howe Jr. wrestled for years to find a way to mechanize sewing. With the family pinched by poverty, his wife sewed for others by hand at home. Watching her sew, Howe visualized ways to mechanize the process. In 1845, he built his first sewing machine and soon constructed an improved model, which he carried to the patent office in Washington to apply for a patent. He received the fifth United States patent, number 4750, for a sewing machine in 1846. Howe's model used a grooved and curved eye-pointed needle carried by a vibrating arm. The needle was provided with thread from a spool. Loops of thread from the needle were locked by a second thread carried by a shuttle which moved through the loop by means of reciprocating drivers. The cloth hung vertically, impaled on pins on a metal baster plate. The baster plate moved intermittently under the needle by means of a toothed wheel. The length of each stitching operation depended upon the length of the baster plate, and only straight seams could be sewn. When the end of the baster plate reached the position of the needle, the sewing was stopped. The cloth was removed from the baster plate, and the plate was moved back to its original position. This resulted in an imperfect way to sew, but it marked the beginning of successful mechanized sewing. Howe's patent claims were upheld in court to allow his claim to control the combination of the eye-pointed needle with a shuttle to form a lock stitch. Howe met with limited success in marketing his sewing machine Hay quickly realized his fortune depended on defending his patent and collecting royalty fees from sewing machine manufacturers. These royalty licenses granted companies the right to use the Howe patent on their machines. In 1856, after years of lawsuits over patent rights, Elias Howe and three companies, Wheeler and Wilson, Grover and Baker, and I.M. Singer, formed the first patent pool in American industry. The organization was called the Sewing Machine Combination and or the Sewing Machine Trust. This freed the companies from expensive and time-consuming litigation and enabled them to concentrate on manufacturing and marketing their machines. He Elias Howe Company was a 19th and early 20th century musical firm located in Boston, USA and founded by Elias Howe Jr., 1820-1895. His company was successful, selling more than a million copies of his music instruction books by 1892. Howe was cousin to the inventor of the sewing machine and related to Julia Ward Howe, composer of the Battle Hymn of the Republic, the development of the company during Howe's lifetime. Howe acquired a fiddle as a young boy and soon learned to play working his way through tunes that he heard. He couldn't afford to buy the expensive sheet music of his day, but his ear was good enough for him to write down tunes that he heard other New England fiddlers play he put together a book of tunes in this manner, while still young. Civil War era book of military-inspired music, including military calls, marches and dances, published in 1863 by Elias Howe. Please subscribe this channel. Musical publications Howe eventually acquired a substantial collection of these tunes and managed to get them published in book form in 1840 as the musician's companion. 2. He was unable to pay all at once for the 500 copies that printer Wright and Kidder agreed to print for him, but bought copies as he was able. The books were successful, and he sold enough of them, door to door and city to city, to open his own shop in 1842. But bought copies as he was able. The books were successful, and he sold enough of them, door to door and city to city, to open his own shop in 1842. By 1850, Howe had published several other volumes of tune collections and musical instruction. In about that year, he sold his rights to those works to the Oliver Ditson Company of Boston and agreed to desist from publishing music for a period of 10 years, buying land in South Framingham and managing the South Reading Ice Company. He returned to publishing in about 1861. After the term of the agreement with Ditson had elapsed and became one of the country's most prolific musical publishers. By his own estimate, he compiled and published about 200 musical works under his own name and using the pseudonyms Gumbo Chaff, Patrick O'Flanagan, and Mary O'Neill. Musical Instruments Sky notes that during the American Civil War, Howe expanded his activities to include manufacturing drums for Massachusetts regiments. 2. 
he was offered the position of Director of Bands for the United States Army and the rank of Lieutenant Colonel by President Lincoln. He chose instead to continue manufacturing drums and fifes and publishing books on their use in marching bands. Location of the company barely visible, silhouetted against the sky at the far end of the square, at the left, is the Howe's Music sign of the Elias Howe Company. The Elias Howe Company for many years was located at 88 Court Street in Boston and many of the volumes of sheet music and instrumental instruction that the company produced bear that address. Archival photos of the Scully Square area of Boston dating from the 1880s often show the Howe's Music sign silhouetted against the sky above the buildings at the end of Court Street. He Howe all name arises from the association of the younger Howes, William H. and Edward F. Howe, of Boston with George L. Orme of Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. A May 1896 newspaper article announced a deal between Orman's son and the Elias Howe Company for the United States manufacturing rights, on a royalty basis, for the celebrated Orme guitar and lute banjo. G. L. Orme was the younger partner in J. L. Orme and Son, a company founded by his father, James L. Orme. J. L. Orman's son was a retailer of musical instruments, primarily pianos and organs, and a publisher of sheet music. They also had a musical instrument factory for their violins and guitars over their piano, wear room, 7. Like Elias Howe Jr., J. L. Orm was deceased by the time that the Howe Orm instruments appeared and his son, George, ran the company. George Orm was an associate of James S. Back, with whom he shared patent rights to the musical instrument design that became the hallmark of Howe Orm instruments. This design, first described in an 1893 patent, U.S. Patent No. 508858, awarded to back with half ownership assigned to Orm. The critical feature described in the patent is a raised longitudinal belly ridge, extending along the top of the instrument, under the strings, from the end of the fingerboard to the tailpiece. The innovation is depicted on a guitar in the patent application but the patent text makes mention of its applicability to other stringed instruments. A subsequent design patent, U.S. Patent No. D27560, shows the concept applied to a guitar-shaped mandolin. How Orm instruments were among the first to be produced in the United States in multiple sizes analogous to the members of the violin family, that mostly interconnect with sewing machine. These mandolin family instruments are unique not only because of the raised longitudinal belly ridge, but because they're shaped like guitars and have absolutely flat backs. Although guitar-shaped mandolins were subsequently manufactured by other firms, an Elias Howe Company catalogue from approximately 1910 notes that the Howe Orm mandolins were the first such instruments. The catalogue also points out the ease of holding a guitar-shaped instrument in contrast to the awkwardness of the bowl back mandolins of that era. He guitars had another unique feature in addition to the longitudinal ridge. Their necks were easily detachable and their angle could be adjusted without any disassembly. 11. The neck design, like the longitudinal ridge, originated with J.S. Back and is described most fully in U.S. Patent No. 538205, issued to Back, with half ownership to G.L. Orm, in April, 1895. Examples of a guitar-shaped mandolin made solely by J.L. The J.L. Orm and Son, Lute Banjo, had a rounded, fat, oval body, with a neck held on by three screws, making the angle adjustable, the U.S. Based, Elias Howe Company's Howe Orm instruments had bodies shaped like guitars, with, at least for the mandolins, necks that were glued to the bodies with a dovetail joint. The patents covered a wide variety of instruments, being used to create guitars, mandolins and lute banjos. Opinions by collectors have indicated that the Elias Howe instruments had a pressed soundboard, which kept its shape with internal braces. The Howe Orm guitar also shared the adjustable neck system, Elias Howe Jr. was born on a farm near Spencer, Massachusetts in 1819. He left the farm at age 16 and traveled to Lowell, Massachusetts seeking to apprentice in a machine shop. After the financial panic of 1837 he lost his job in Lowell and moved to Boston, finding work in the shop of R.E. Davis making mariner's tools and scientific equipment. Please subscribe this channel. Due, perhaps, to the inquisitive-minded nature of the clientele, inventing dreams and gossip were often discussed in Davis's shop. Local legend has it that this is how Howe gained the inspiration for his sewing machine. When an inspiring inventor brought in a knitting machine seeking encouragement, Davis replied to the man, why are you wasting your time over a knitting machine? Take my advice, try something that will pay. Make a sewing machine. Within two years, by May 1845, Howe had a machine that was sewing seams. By July he finished his first two suits of wool clothes, one for George Fisher and one for himself. 
but to do more than his predecessors had been able to do, Howe had to interest the public in his machine. He put on a display, a race against five seamstresses, and his machine finished five entire seams before any of the seamstresses finished one. The crowds remained wary, however, and the protests of the local tailors proved effective. Howe did not receive a single order for his machine. Undaunted, Howe continued on. He finished a second machine and was awarded U.S. Patent Number 4750 on September 10, 1846. George Fisher, his loyal investor, was growing frustrated after funding the project for more than two years without any returns. Howe sent his brother Amasa Howe to England, hoping to find a more willing potential market. Amasa met William Thomas, a manufacturer of umbrellas, corsets, and leather goods, and struck a deal in which Elias went to England to work on a new machine specifically adapted for corset making, and he sold one of his original machines to Thomas for £250 sterling. Please subscribe this channel. In order to earn enough money to travel back home, Howe pawned his remaining original machine and his patent papers. Even more shocking was that the machines being sold were based on his design. He quickly repurchased his machine and patent papers from the London pawn shop, and then began to send letters to the suspected patent infringers. This ultimately forced Howe into court, which was expensive but his family and friends again came to his aid. His two major cases were against Walter Hunt and Isaac Singer, and he won both times. In the case between Howe and Hunt in the 1850s, the patent commissioner explained why Howe was deemed the rightful king of sewing machines despite Hunt having created a machine first and which has been made practically useful, all reasonable presumption should be in favor of the inventor who has been the means of conferring the real benefit upon the world. Howe won the case, but as the sewing machine grew in popularity, all of the major manufacturers began to make. Please subscribe this channel. Thanks for watching.